For six years, I was a middle school teacher. I like to pause here so I can take in the looks of horror I usually get after saying that. My usual response to those looks is that being a teacher is everything you think it would be, but also so much more. It takes a special human and a little bit of bravery to truly appreciate what happens inside of a middle school, or any school for that matter. And I'm fortunate to be one of those people who can walk into a school building and immediately feel at ease. As you can imagine, every day in the classroom was like a live action episode of kids say the darndest things. And over the years, I received countless questions, particularly about health, that have surprised me, made me laugh, and some that have scared me a little bit. Everything from, since all fruits have sugar in them, aren't all fruits actually bad for you? To, what is, what is that thing in the back of my throat? To, Mr. Savage, will I actually go blind if I, you know, too much? <laughs> Should I be keeping track of how many times I do it? Where do you find gay condoms? Are they in the same section as regular condoms? Mr. Savage, is it true that you can actually get pregnant just from being in the pool with a guy? Because my brother and I swim together all the time and that could get weird. <laughs> Mr. Savage, I hear that you can survive without food as long as you drink water. How long would my friend have to stop eating in order to lose weight? Mr. Savage, if you don't actually hit a vein, is cutting really all that bad for you? What I found most alarming isn't that these questions were being asked. What was most alarming was that these questions were being asked by 12 to 15 year olds, many of whom had older siblings or parents who had achieved a significant level of education. Despite those factors, there still existed a knowledge deficit that was the result of a lack of information or the spread of dangerous misinformation. One of the most important things to realize about kids is the older they get, the less they ask questions. At the same time, the older they get, the more serious the ramifications become for the decisions that they make. Decisions that are typically based on a lack of information or the dangerous misinformation that they accumulate during their younger years. As a result of my experiences, I decided to look into exactly how and when students were receiving health education. And what I found started to bring things more sharply into focus. In 2007, the Joint Committee on National Health Standards recommended that students in grades three through 12 receive 80 hours, just over three days, of health education per academic school year. That's 80 hours of a 180-day school year that consists of approximately 1,440 hours. I thought, surely, most schools are easily surpassing that recommendation. So I decided to look a little bit closer to home to figure out exactly how and when Ohio students were receiving health education. What I found is that according to the Ohio Department of Education, Ohio law does not permit the State Board of Education to adopt health education standards in Ohio. Though, the law does direct schools to include health education and other related topics at various times throughout its K-12 curriculum. Allow me to translate. In the state of Ohio, we cannot set a, man, a minimum standard for what kids have to learn about health. But the law suggests that maybe, at some point, we talk about health-like stuff, eventually, before kids graduate from high school. What this typically looks like is this. An awkward single gender conversation in elementary school about body odor and menstrual cycles and growth spurts. A similar follow-up conversation in middle school, which might include the introduction of STIs. However, what's often absent for that conversation is what you actually have to do in order to contract an STI in the first place. And a single semester of physical education in high school as a graduation requirement, which in some places can actually be circumvented if a student enrolls in a single year of the Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps, or JROTC. In some states, there's even an online option to completing that PE requirement because... 
because. My findings led me to this realization. What public education needs is a robust national health curriculum that grows in sophistication right alongside its students. A health education curriculum that allows for the teaching of practical knowledge as a way to promote proactive prevention rather than reactive intervention. A health education curriculum that brings parents, educators, medical professionals, and child development specialists to the same table in order to spark a dialogue and produce a curriculum that is at once developmentally appropriate, required annually, relevant and engaging, as well as cross-curricular. Now, I guarantee you that this is not the most complex talk that you'll hear today. But I can also guarantee you that this idea will be among the toughest to actually see through the implementation. There are numerous reasons for that, but I can summarize those reasons by saying this. In our country, the discussion about health education has been minimized to a dialogue about the moral relevancy of sex and reproductive health education. Both of those things are important topics. However, neither of those things should be the totality of a student's health education. So what I ask of you for the next few minutes is to listen to my proposal. Listen with open ears, and more importantly, an open mind, and just picture it. Picture an elementary school environment in which every student can give you a developmentally appropriate explanation of their anatomy and how to care for it. Picture a middle school environment in which each student is engaged in project-based learning about adequate nutrition, food label literacy, and how to prepare meals that are at once practical, appetizing, and healthy. Picture a high school environment in which every student studies the intricate science of mental health and is able to articulate the importance of counseling, even in the absence of a formal mental health diagnosis. What I'm proposing isn't just about sex education. This can be the new reality of health education if we empower children to be independent, informed thinkers who are engaged in a curriculum that guides them to make better choices about their physical health while making them stronger, sharper, and ultimately, better prepared for life. Fortunately, Nationwide Children's has several programs that are going above and beyond to meet students and families where they are to provide this health education. Those programs include Care Connection, which is, an, which is a toolkit of services that provide school-based health and school-based health education. Programs like our school-based asthma therapy program, which was described to me by the parent of a first grade boy, that she loved this program because not only did it help her son control his asthma while at school, but it made her first grader into an advocate for his own health because he was able to recognize the signs of a problematic asthma attack. Programs like our school-based health clinics, which work to transform local Columbus City schools into community health centers where parents and students can come together and engage in programming that teaches them all together about health, in addition to spreading primary care to families who often go without. Programs like our school-based behavioral health service, which helps to break the stigma about behavioral health in low-income and minority communities. Behavioral health was described to me by a 17-year-old as the part of her week that she most looked forward to because it was the one time that she could talk to an adult who would just listen. It is fantastic that Care Connection and several other nationwide children's programs are living up to the hospital's values of doing the right thing and taking an innovative approach to promoting health and wellness. What would be even more fantastic is if our efforts were a mere supplement to a robust health education curriculum that secures our children's fundamental right to life by teaching them the very skills that will preserve their lives. Skills that transcend the walls of a classroom and have a lasting generational impact. So now what? I'm not under the delusion that this talk will fix everything, because it won't. I mean, some of the world's best and brightest, they've been out 
at this for decades. But there's two problems with that. The first problem is that some of the world's best and brightest have yet to come to me for my opinion about this. <laughs> the second problem is that the best and the brightest rarely take a step outside of their bubble to take in a diverse range of thoughts from diverse minds. Minds like the ones in this room right now. It's not about taking several major steps. It's about taking a lot of small steps, and everyone in this room can do that if we live up to these three eyes. Getting informed, getting involved, and getting innovative. It is unfortunate that we don't have health education standards in Ohio. However, that gives us the freedom to really create it as we see fit. Right here at the hospital, we offer community education programs that range from taking care of your kitten, to babysitting, to managing ADHD and living with autism. Give yourself a moment to get informed by visiting that section of our website and actually looking at what we do offer. And if one of those things falls within your wheelhouse, get involved, volunteer to participate. If you sense that there's a void for something that we can be putting out into the community, create it yourself, be innovative. Do what needs to be done to get the information out to our community. There is no such thing as too much information. If you want to take a step outside of the classroom, or sorry, out, I'm still stuck on being a teacher. If you want to take a step outside of the hospital, be informed about what's happening in your community. A few months ago, I attended a program at a school in which the administration had invited the entire community into the school in order to learn about their curriculum and their partnerships for the next school year. Myself included, there were five adults at this program. Two of the other adults were teachers of that school. Five adults from a student population of 750. 750 students that not only have a parent or a guardian, but other adults in the community who care about their well-being. Now, I could have seen that and left. However, I decided to live up to these three eyes. I got informed about what the school wanted to do. I got involved by telling the participants who were there about nationwide children's presence in their building as it relates to school health clinics and behavioral health. I got innovative about the ways that the parents could help to spread that message, and by the end of that week, I had heard back from 10 parents, none of which were there, who heard about what we do from the two parents who were there. Small moves like that are what the decision makers need to hear and see. And if they see and hear enough, then maybe that will persuade them to take a step outside of the red tape and finally realize that it truly is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Thank you. <laughs>